to let you guys know. So yeah, hi everyone, welcome uh, to the talk and welcome back to those that have uh, joined us previously. And for those that haven't, I'm Sarah Al-Muhiri, I'm an artist based in Abu Dhabi. And today we have Sheikh al mazrua with us um, for the fourth episode of Artist Talks. And just a few reminders to keep yourself on mute uh, throughout the talk until there's a segment where we can also uh, hear your voices and to engage all together. And um, for any questions or uh, comments, keep them in the chats and then we will get to them uh, post uh, Sheikha speaking about her work. And uh, just uh, to let you know that next week there won't be uh, a session because of Eid. And I normally do two episodes with the one week off, so that worked perfectly. But we'll be back on June 1st and it will be at the regular time, which is uh, 7 p.m. And just like always, the structure is Sheikha will be, um, or the artist, will be showing images and talking a little bit about her work. And uh, just for those that aren't familiar or would like to know a little bit more uh, to get acquainted with her work. And then we will have the questions and uh, kind of like uh, just choosing a few interesting questions from the chat. And then following that, we'll have a focused dialogue. The session will officially end, but for those that would like to stay a bit further um, to, yeah stick around. Yeah, so without further ado, I would just also like to introduce Sheikha um, with a little, a little bit from her bio, but I'd also like to say that um, I actually first knew about her work through my mentor who was helping me with my capstone and she asked me to look a little bit at her work. So it's very honored, it's kind of like full circle to have you here today. And the first work that I saw of hers was um, the the one in Jamil Art for the Artist uh, Garden Commissions, which was really beautiful. And I think you'll be hitting on that today too. So Sheikh al Mazrur is an artist and educator based in Dubai and received her master's in, from the Chelsea College of Fine Arts, University of the Arts, London. Her practice is anchored in history of art, borrowing formally from minimalism and intellectually from conceptual art. She's influenced by artists from the modernist and Bauhaus movements, such as Paul Klee, Carl Andre. And uh, Sheikha uses the formal aspects of minimalism to engage in a current fascination with materiality and art. Often in her work, she combines mass-produced materials such as electronic waste or construction materials with color and form, experimenting with these resources to create abstract geometric arrangements. Fascinated by notions of physical space, her sculptures and installations materialize as simple gestures that emphasize the representation of tension, weight, and space. Her most recent solo exhibition is called Rearranging the Riddle, which will be our primary focus today. Um, and it's, you can also visit it virtually through the Marai Art Center website. And for the time being, she has, um, she's participated in a lot, of, uh, a lot of group exhibitions and too many to talk about currently, but I'm just gonna highlight a few. Um, one is from Barcelona to Abu Dhabi, works from the MACPA art collection and dialogue with the Emirates. The other is emerging art, Beyond Merging Artists for Abu Dhabi Art. And a public privacy was the inaugural edition of the UAE Unlimited. So without further ado, if you would like to share your screen and your images. Thank you, Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, first of all, Ramadan Kareem for, um, to, to all of you. And I'm really happy to see a lot of uh, familiar faces. Um, I'm going to start with sharing the screen. Uh, host, uh, can you enable me to share the screen? <laughs> Is it working now? Yeah. I had this earlier today too. I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> So is this uh, visible to everyone? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, um, I'm gonna take you through uh, my journey of, um, uh, you know, becoming an artist and coming back uh, and being an educator in, in the Emirates. Uh, one of the reasons I um, plan to go for further education is uh, my eagerness to come back and teach. Um, I, I really fell in love in teaching when I started. Uh, uh, I started off as a technical tutor before getting my master's. And one of my mentors uh, encouraged me to go for further education and come back and give back to the country. Uh, 
And I believe uh, the first day uh, of class being at Chelsea, um, we were all asked to uh, show uh, our previous work and portfolios. And I, I recall one of our mentors saying, um, after spending about four hours presenting our works, uh, he came around saying that he's not interested in any of our practice. And he doesn't want to see anything that he's seen on the screen uh, in the program in the next uh, few months uh, pursuing our masters. And being, being a student abroad and expecting to you know, further develop your practice and being shocked with a mentor telling you that he's not interested in your previous practice and would like to see something new already kept me in the state of the unknown. And, and I believe that was the best uh, advice, sh shocking advice any mentor would give uh, a student. Um, so I spent about six months of my time there at Chelsea, um, really fascinated with the foundry. I was just being extremely playful with materiality. I was, uh, I was exhausting all the materials around me. So uh, towards the end of uh, the MA program, I came up with this work that you see in front of you. And obviously you can see this interest that kind of arise from this ongoing discor uh, discourse around materiality and art. So using base, uh, based, uh, you know, basic uh, gestures, the work calls attention to physical representation of tension, weight, and physical space. Uh, the work uh, usually materialize the ideas, uh, ideas such as uncertainty, doubt, instability, through a playful yet highly formal exploration of the material physical property. So you will see here in the next few slides uh, different compositions of the works where I try to create this tension within the display itself. You see here a plank of wood, uh, a strap, uh, and a terracotta. Uh, from a, a sculptural perspective, everything is studied, everything is kind of, there's a, a mechan hidden, hidden mechanism where things are sitting together. Um, and the way I'm going to take you through the journey of my practice is I want to show you things that I've done as a student, pursuing my master's, coming back and given this opportunity through um, ADMAF. Uh, I see Nina here, uh, who used to be um, we used to work with ADMAF, um, and I remember their, their brief was very specific. So there was conservative, uh, they had like a preservation of islands and they wanted us to uh, look around and get inspiration and do like studies uh, around these uh, very specific areas in Abu Dhabi. But however, I came, through, uh, I came uh, with a proposal um, that um, Nina has given me the green light to go around <laughs> Abu Dhabi. So I started driving off from Abu Dhabi slowly to Dubai, Sharjah, and then I ended up being somewhere in Ras Al Khaimah, which is an area called Bel Shoka. Um, this piece you see in front of you is called Sandland. Uh, it consisted of a series of perfectly executed concentric circles enclosed within a, a square. So here, um, Initially, my proposal, I had uh, different uh, palettes. I had different ideas, different geometric shapes. However, when I came and stumbled upon this area, there was this eagerness to create this intervention within the land itself. So as you can see here, there is almost, I'm playing with the duality of a, perf a perfect frame where you can see almost a painting, a photograph, but then you can also see from other images that the surface wasn't even flat. So I had to play with this kind of uh, almost illusion of space within um, the site. Um, this is another etching that I intentionally put after the works that I've done for the land art, uh, the land uh, sand land piece, and it's it's this geometric form. Uh, the geometric forms are constantly reappearing within my practice. So this is an etching uh, I've done, and then when I go back, uh, it's not it's not like an intentional um, inspiration from previous work. But when I when I was putting this presentation together for the talk, I've tend, uh, I've noticed that there is this almost a thread between the work that is constantly repetitive, um, as you can see here. Um, this is uh, just to show you a bit of the size. This was about a 15 uh, 
uh, meters by 15 meters in total. And um, obviously it's an ephemeral piece. It lasted for about a year and a half. I've got friends who used to go for hiking and they would take pictures and you would see, um, you would see the work almost disappearing within um, the time, a time frame between a year and a half and two years. Um, funny enough, uh, if you were back in the day when we used to uh, look into Google Maps, you would actually see that tiny little square with circles. Um, through Google uh, Maps. Um, this is another image just to show you the scale. Um, and this is what uh, just now uh, Sara has mentioned. Um, I was lucky enough to be selected among artists uh, to exhibit uh, in its first artist garden commissions uh, through Jamil Art Center. Um, when I, when I was given the site, uh, this idea of the courtyard really interested me. I was quite in, inspired by this space in between two buildings. And then the idea of the greenhouse started to kind of develop as I was doing my research. Um, what interests me the most about a greenhouse is the dichotomy that comes with a construction. So I'm interested with, I, I'm, in, I'm really interested in this kind of interior yet exterior, man-made but also natural. There's this dichotomy also that goes on with creation and destruction, containment, constriction, transmission and reflection. So I really wanted to project that within a very simple repetition um, form of what a glass house would be. And you would see uh, other sides of the house um, so they are, they are divided into six segments and the, the color, uh, you see the color gradation between uh, the six of them. Um, the absence of the vegetation is reflected in the color obviously and the form of the glass. Here's another image from a different angle. Um, I'll move into another piece that I've created and this was one of the best commissions that I have experienced. Um, Four years ago, approximately four years ago, Abu Dhabi Art has commissioned uh, Emirati artist uh, for uh, for uh, their uh, what is it called? It was called the um, Beyond Emerging Artist. Beyond Emerging, yeah, it was called the Beyond Emerging. But what was interesting really about that uh, commission is was it wasn't about funding the artist. It wasn't just artists, here you go, this is the money and you can you know, create anything based on your proposals. But what I really enjoyed about this commission specifically, the educational background that came with it. So it was based on workshop, field trips. And I initially came with a very simple proposal. However, this commission um, uh, really expanded my proposal from the first step to the you know, towards the installation. And I was lucky enough to have Christiana DeMarque and Hamed Kalam to be mentoring me throughout this process. And it, you know, as I mentioned, the commission consisted of educational program, a field trip to Switzerland and a series of workshops. And the end result was a, a three meter um, sculpture. Here I'm showing you one of the most uh, largest material archive uh, in a place called St. Gelan in Switzerland. Um, the foundry is called Kunzkeserai, and it's uh, designed specifically for uh, sculptors. Um, here are some of the, I don't know why the image is a little bit tilted. Uh, so this is the work I'm talking about. So um, obviously from a, a, a sculptor perspective, I was always interested in the materials that are not usually seen in the end result. Um, so I started to look at this material archive. When you look at a, a bronze sculpture and you never think about the process that it goes through to get that bronze figurative sculpture, for example. So it goes through the wax, through the plaster, to the mold making, to the, you know, I, I enjoy looking at that process, long, exhausting, and I wanted to stage that. And within this work, um, I have used, um, 10 different materials. So it starts off with, uh, if we are looking from the top to the bottom, we're looking at a concrete, rubber, there's marble, there is bee wax, there is wood, pine wood, resin, uh, um, bronze, plaster, copper, and chamont. 
And all of these sculptures are arranged very specifically. If, uh, if you're familiar with the Fibonacci sequence, is one plus one is two, and two plus the previous number would give you that total. So if we're looking back at this, uh, the weight of the first material plus the second material would give us the, sec the third, and so on. Um, and what I really like here is also staging the sculptural quality and mass that one cannot see. Uh, for example, the weight of the plaster plus the bronze would give us this much of copper. And, and I'm interested in that mass that is kind of also mathematically driven. Um, and follow, follow that work, following that work, um, I had a commission uh, through uh, Sharjah Art Foundation. And as you can see here, there are four different types of metal. There is brass, aluminum, bronze, and copper. And uh, again, here we're talking about sculptural qualities of uh, a material. Um, what I have done here, they are all in the size of an A4 sheet. Um, usually when you go to an industrial area, those sheets come in uh, four by six foot and they come in like flat sheets. So I bought four pieces of metal. Um, those are the four types and they were all in the size of almost a door. And the thickness of that was like about two mm. And what I've done here is I melted those sheets into an A4 document and I called this piece cast documents. And what I wanted to stage within these works is the weight of words. Obviously, they're all of the same size. However, we're talking about, again, sculptural language, the mass has, is absolutely different. So the weight of the aluminum was about like 12 kgs, but the weight of the copper was about 70 kgs, although they're aesthetically all the same. And I have intentionally um, made all the four corners quite smooth and wanted to show uh, that surface of, you know, the quality of foundry of pouring metal intentionally visible to the naked eye. Um, and they were arranged on four different pedestals. You can see here a clear image of the surface from the top. And then uh, I move on um, into uh, my latest show uh, with Laurie Shabibi, uh, which was titled Expansion Extension. Um, the title draws from my own experience conceiving the show, expanding and extending in my own research into the meaning of sculpture material and its representational function. Um, obviously, these I, I would just slide through the images. Um, they, I had a series of these works. Um, as you can see here, again, I'm playing with uh, geometric forms. Um, they all appear soft, spongy, not qualities normally associated with steel structure. Yet in this new series, I made them appear inherent. Uh, each of them are coated uh, steel pieces created for the exhibition has an element of surprise, uh, playing with positive and negative tension and illusion of color and material. We look at this piece that was titled Expand. Uh, is a single bright red cuboid that bulges out from the wall. It crumbled edges evokes a sense of malleable and um, a, frig a fragile uh, moment. And the other, other works you can see here, I have mistaken with the arrangement of this, sorry. Uh, but you can see here um, a different arrangement. As I mentioned earlier, I tend to really exhaust the material. Uh, I don't tend to stop with one uh, experimentation. And here you can see a little bit of illusion uh, as well, while it's actually a flat sheet of uh, metal. Um, a different arrangement here where the also, you can see the introduction of glass within my work. Um, it was purely resting on that uh, structure of metal underneath. Um, that was that, what I've already shown you uh, in the previous slides were what I've done pre the solo uh, show I had uh, with Mariah. Now, uh, with the Mariah uh, show, which was my uh, very last solo show I had uh, two months ago before the pandemic, um, was an, an absolute uh, new direction within my work. 
um, and it was purely based on theoretical uh, research. Um, and I started posing questions to myself as an artist and reflecting. I think it's very important as an artist to always look back at your practice and question your current status and question, um, you know, um, where where is the practice going? And I believe during that phase, um, I was approached by uh, Mariah Art Center and was asked to pick a curator. And as you know, as an artist, you don't usually get that opportunity where you get to select the curator. And I was quite fortunate uh, when I was uh, given that, and I couldn't think of anyone else except for Christiana. Um, I have known Christiana for almost a decade now, and um, ever since I was a student until this very last show, uh, she she really managed to. Um, read my thoughts without even speaking. And I was reading two books uh, at the time. One of them is called On Abstract by Bryony Fair, and the other one was uh, called Keto Styro, The Richard of the Screen. And I believe those two books really question my current practice. So I started pulling out some text from uh, these books. And what Christiana has done along the course of almost six, seven months was she really provoked me with her questions. She, she was setting down these questions for me to answer, which was part of the publication, but also provoked me as an artist and, and to be extremely honest uh, with where I wanted the direction of the work to go. And pulling these, uh, again, lines from the book, it says, in free fall, a thought experiment on vertical perspective. Falling is relational. If there is nothing to fall towards, you may not even be aware that you're falling. So the following question uh, is from Christiana. Your sculptures are based on physical suggestion of tension, instability, and potential imbalance. Therefore, therefore implying the notion of falling as possible outcome. How do you express the re re relationality of falling in your work? And um, for me, uh, I feel like within this work, um, I have been going through a lot of phases and I wanted to kind of also project that within the work and not just hide behind the sculptural qualities. And I wanted to allow my personal uh, stories within the works. Um, and I answered that question saying, uh, falling not necessarily means falling apart, but could possibly mean falling into place. Falling is transitional, a place in between. Hito Styrol elaborates on perspective or verticality when she argues the notion of falling. In a vertical perspective, there is a multitude of presentation, not just a vertical perspective of floating, but there is also a vertical perspective when you are falling. The horizon multiplies, fragments, distorts, and shards. And I really started to take this within my uh, personal work. Um, another quote here, in free fall, a thought of experiment on vertical perspective, Hito Styrol wrote, in many of these new visualities, what seemed like a helpless stumble into an abyss actually turns out to be a new representational freedom. And perhaps this helps us get over the last assumption implicit in this thought experiment, the idea that we need a ground in the first place. The idea of the groundless to me is an invitation to question the, the necessity of the ground, to explore the sensitivity of expression in this state of lexical ambiguity. For example, the title of the show, Rearranging the Rhythm. So the entire show was actually based on a dream, a dream that suggested a color. And I really wanted to bring that color into physicality. Um, I can, the, the, the shade was almost uh, tangible and I, I kept on trying so many times to achieve that color. Um, here you can see some experimentation. It looks like I was Klein blue, which I wasn't really after. And you see other tests done here in the studio. Is the screen uh, a little bit down or I think it is a bit. Do you see it full screen? No, um, there's a lot of black around the image. Some images are like this one. Okay. So uh, the entire show was based on this paradox. And as it's, highlight as it's highlighted in the title of the show, Rearranging the Riddle, a riddle that doesn't want to be arranged. 
And it starts with this very first work. It's called Close to the Coast, but not too close. Um, and by saying that in itself, there is almost an ambiguous of how close you are to the coast. Um, now, this work is based on a paradox, which is called Soritis Paradox. The Soritis Paradox, uh, the Soritis Paradox explains a story of a heap of sand. If you had a heap of sand and you keep taking a single grain individually each time, excluding the fact that taking a single grain will turn the heap into a non-heap. You keep taking a grain, what happens then? When you're left with one grain only, is that still a heap? The biggest question, if the answer is no, at what point of your action did the heap turn into a non-heap? The word heap is very vague. There isn't a clear boundary between heap and non-heap. Mostly that doesn't matter. We get, along with we get along well enough applying the word heap on the basis of casual impressions. It's uh, riddled with vague predicts. For example, when you go call someone that tall guy, what made that guy tall in comparison to that short guy? And when, what is tall or tall enough? So there's this amb ambiguity that comes with this paradox. So when you say it's a heap of sand, when does it stop becoming a non-heap? And so goes the title, close to the coast, but not too close. How close am I to that coast? Um, against that uh, body of work, um, there was a panels of glass. Um, the title of the glass was called To Create Meaning in Perception. Uh, the work questions and investigates the structure of our reality and reflects on the perception of time both literally and metaphorically. Uh, there are five different shades of uh, panels. Uh, when you stand from one perspective, you get to see the, the five different shades. When you stand from another perspective, they all change colors. They become a little bit more colorful. Uh, the viewer is then confronted with visual, unstable, spatial, and temporal condition. These five panels of uh, glass capture a shade of blue that reflects and refracts to create a constant changing, uh, to, uh, to create a constant change and set things in motion. Uh, it also captures the body perception of the world and itself in it. By employing, uh, by employing mirrored and reflective surfaces, the work encourages viewers to become conscious of their surroundings. Here's another shade where you see, it, another angle where you see this kind of hint of uh, pink in, in diff from different angles as you walk, it really changes in colors. Um, something I forgot to mention is also for once, I've never started the body of work putting the titles first. So within uh, this show, I had the titles written down before even thinking of the medium. In a way, the titles kind of dictated what medium I'm going to be using. So based on certain occasion, uh, occasions I've been through, these titles were written down, and I never thought that they would ever be artworks. Uh, for example, in the glass, to create meaning and perception, I couldn't find any better medium that would create that uh, imagery within the work. Um, here you see uh, two blocks of uh, resin in different shades, and the title of the work is called Sky and Ocean and Everything in Between. Uh, here I'm interested in the effect of color. How do we feel about a color? How do we respond to a specific color? What influences us on a color that makes us behave in a certain way? How do we favor a color if we do? Um, I'm often stuck in this kind of a spider web between meaning and art. Maybe not the art itself, but more spontaneously an expression that comes from categorizing such an artwork. The, um, uh, the amalgamation of both encourages uh, me immensely. Uh, here, as I mentioned, two resonances display in their meaning. Uh, that attempts to give form both a thought and almost a sensation. And in the other side uh, of the gallery space, you would see two pieces of copper um, that have two different uh, 
starting points and two different shapes. Uh, you see one that starts with a square and ends up with a circle and the other one with a larger circle that ends up with a small uh, circle. And um, here the title of the work is called um, We Met Halfway. Uh, where is the half when we are looking at a form that is constantly changing? The word, the word anamorphic comes from the Greek ana, again, and morphs form. It refers to a distorted image. Um, in this work, um, I was interested in the distortion of different forms. When do they collide? Where does the transition take place? If we slice the whole, where is the halfway? How middle is the halfway? Is it somewhere in between? When do they become one, connected? To non-identical forms, a moment where there is a difference, where the difference is almost collapsed. If identity depends on differences and this very difference collapses, the identity collapses too. The work shift in its perspective, it suggests and signifies other things beyond themselves. The size, and the form, the size of the forms and the distance are, inter are interrelated. Perception is relative as the size shrinks and the distance increase. It was pretty challenging to um, create these works, especially the one that has um, a different form, which was this, uh, transforming a very stubborn material as copper uh, and changing its perspective from two sides. Intentionally, I have used uh, copper for its human-like quality and the way it reflects and captures uh, the surrounding. And as soon as you touch copper, it starts picking up fingerprints, almost personalities, identities within the material. Um, and the other part of the works, um, sorry, the images are a little bit dropped down. Um, like, was, uh, just to give context on the resin pieces and the copper pieces, what are the dimensions of those? Um, this was about one, uh, 100 uh, diameter. And um, they were relatively close to uh, one another. And the other one, I believe, was 70 by 70 uh, square um, from one side. And the other question was? The resin pieces, the two blocks. Um, these were, I have, I have copies of them here in my studio. I can show you around later. Um, these were 100 by 70. And the height was about 20 centimeters. Thank you. Um, sorry again, the images dropped a bit down. Um, so as I mentioned, the entire show was about capturing that color seen in a dream. You walk around the exhibition space and all you see is the shade of blue. Um, I, I believe, Sarah, you were as well interested in these sample colors that you see in a market shelf. And I remember walking uh, across creative minds as I was trying to find some uh, molds. Um, I walked around these shelves and I was really intrigued with their titles. It's funny how uh, they're labeled and how it actually creates an environment. Uh, for me, reading the shades of blue specifically, um, I wasn't just looking at a shade, but I was also feeling an environment. So looking at these shades uh, of colors, um, I wanted to transform, I really wanted to transform that color shade that we see into a physical form. So for example, when we read Gulf Coast, which is this one, I wanted to transform that feeling into a physical space. Um, you can see here, blue to the bone. So it's, it's a feeling, it's a feeling. It's not just a shade of a color. So as you're reading these leaflets or color samples, you get that, you, you get almost provoked or, you know, you, you're, you, in your head, you create that uh, environment. And that's what I was trying to do is taking those colors, market shelf colors and transform them into color blocks. So these are blocks of colors that are molded and then you see uh, the label, the market label on them um, embossed in these blocks. Um, another part, uh, another work uh, which was part of the show was the process of paper making. Uh, as you can now probably assume that I'm very much process led 
Um, I don't know whether I like to exhaust myself as an artist or I enjoy the exhausting process of making a piece of work. Uh, so these were handmade paper. Um, I, I bet a lot of you uh, here joining us today are familiar with the process of paper making. So um, there is a, a baka leaves, there is a Japanese cotton. Um, it's such a process that, um, you know, um, to create papers, it's such a process that and it requires a lot of time. And the work was labeled, um, the work was labeled uh, for the things that will remain unsaid. Um, the reason why I titled the works uh, that is making papers by hand is a form of an artistic expression on its own. Through these formal reduction and abstraction, I tend to preserve memories into sculptural forms. The absence of the text is a signifier to uncover hidden narratives. These stack of papers act as a layer of meaning. The process of making the paper from pulp to a defined shape becomes the enactment of experience. Remembering, breathing, sleeping, calling, waiting, counting, going, coming, warming, sweating, emptying, filling, working, traveling, all of these through art is experienced fleetingly, an artifact of a memory as a form of doing. All of these begs the question of what remains and the works, as I mentioned, uh, for all the things that uh, remains unsaid. Um, again, uh, the shade of blue was mixed using a couple of colors. Um, and you, none of these papers is uh, equivalent to the others. They all have a different physicality on its own. Um, if you come closer to the papers, you get to see this almost marble quality because intentionally the pulp is not beaten up uh, enough. Um, the last piece of the show was um, titled Despite the Weather. And funny, ironically, I mean, when you use cyanotype, you require very specific weather and uh, climate. You, re you require very specific uh, sunlight. And there's, again, this opposition with the title Despite the Weather. Um, these were uh, row uh, works I've been doing between classes. Um, I was experimenting with cyanotype and some numbers. Um, these are a bit of experimentations and this was the final body of work. Uh, there were 10 series displayed uh, at the gallery. Um, the paradox within this work forces viewers to rethink or rearrange, which goes back to the title, the meaning behind what they say. Numerical figures are seen in maps, coordinates, postal codes, sequence, dates, duration, identification, and above all time. And those figures create somehow a system, uh, a structure, however, those are all intangible substance. Through the process of cyanotype, I intend, to, I intend to overlap numbers through the use of light. Um, you can see here that I wasn't very kind of restricted in a dark room using, um, you know, all crisp uh, blue shade of color, but I really wanted to play with the duration of the sunlight. Was, I was shifting uh, my prints around the paper, expo overexposing and, and some um, barely exposing. And I believe with this um, image, I wrap up uh, the last, um, this is the final, like one angle of the work uh, displayed uh, at Mariah. And yeah. that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Sheikha, so much. And um, I got to see the show in person and to hear you talk more about the pieces is just beautiful and to see how, the color blue just translates into different mediums and environments. I, I love that word that you're using. Um, and we have a question that can maybe lead us into looking around in your studio. But um, Turina uh, asks, what materials or materials was your favorite to experiment with? And what materials are you experimenting with now? Um, so yeah. I'm a very curious person I'm, and I'm hungry to learn. Um, I like to call myself students 
like for life and I don't really like to restrict myself with one medium. As you can see here within one single show, I have experimented with the resin, copper, cyanotype, paper making, uh, glass, uh, sand, uh, and sand was mixed by hand here in my own studio. So there isn't really a favorite, I would say, but more of this act of exhausting the material until I see myself, you know, delving into another material. I don't even like to call myself a specific, you know, a sculptor or a painter. I think uh, being experimental artist, um, allowing myself to experiment different approaches uh, just allows the work to mature. Definitely. Um, and um, I think this is in response uh, to a few works from the show as well. Um, uh, someone is asking, uh, where does the interest of numbers, weight, and math come from? You could talk a little bit more about that. I think as a sculptor, that is uh, not calling myself sculptor, but working a lot with sculpture, um, that is a, an equation that you can't just miss. Um, you have to be very careful. Like there were so many uh, works that, uh, you know, in previous works that where I haven't considered weight at all, and I would have to pay the price of dealing with, you know, shipping back and forth. So automatically you start considering mass, weight, height, uh, for like simple as simple as access and all of that. But for this very specific work, it was really based on a conversation um, and about trusting, uh, trusting the weather. The, wor the work itself is called Despite the Weather. So no matter what the weather was, just trust it. And I, I couldn't find any better material to kind of trust the sun while exposing a cyanotype. So it just kind of naturally complemented uh, the concept behind the work. Thank you. And just going off of the um, medium of uh, printmaking, as I um, so Jonathan Farrow, who's a professor um, in NYU Abu Dhabi, is asking, uh, you showed an etching early in the presentation, the red circle. Can you talk uh, more about printmaking as a part of your practice? OK. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a very greedy artist. Um, working in a university and being around students is much is the most inspiring platform any artist could be uh, in. Um, I see most of my students here, uh, and it makes me so happy because they are the reason behind my practice constantly going on. Um, you know, you you give a student one brief, and they all come back with different approaches. I see some students in the printmaking and I, I just get the good jealous that I want to spend time in the printmaking. Um, so uh, it's just like, as I mentioned, just hungry and greedy and I like to explore uh, my concept in every dimension possible. Thank you. Um, and we have a question from Adoub specifically about your recent uh, solo exhibition or your latest one. Um, she says there are multiple indications of directions, close, not too close, vertical, falling, the space in between. What she wonders, where does the dream stand in those directions? And after turning this dream into a physical form, is it more tangible or far from? Make, translating dreams into artworks is the only way as an artist to turn them into tangible and, and very tangible memory, I would say, because they were all based kind of on conversations and I didn't want these conversations to be on in a notebook or in my head. I really wanted to translate them um, into tangible objects and answering the space, yeah, it is in between. And if you've noticed that these works are all trying to fit in a space in between. And would you say that the dream changes possibly? Good question, Sarah. Uh, not for the direction I'm going to. No, it doesn't change for me. 
it's just the way that it um, physically is shown. Sorry? Is that, then it's just the way it is physically shown that is a constant like reiteration of it? I mean, or as, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, like with the title of the work, uh, the, sh the entire show is called Rearranging the Rhythm. And it's almost a riddle that, it's a puzzle that doesn't want to be solved. Um, and it falls under the lexical ambiguity. And I, as an artist, I wanted to kind of protect some sort of what I can give the viewer and what I can keep for myself as an artist. So um, the, the riddle will remain unsolved. Um, and the dream cannot be given fully to the viewer. So I wanted to transform them into these kind of geometrical forms or uh, riddle numbers or uh, suggesting this lexical ambiguity within the work. Thank you. Um, and there's another question from Susie Sikorsi who says, um, how important is sketching to materializing your final work, uh, sculpture in this case? And do you prefer to play organically with the material without a set intention of the final artwork's ultimate form? Um, the sketches are always an important process. Um, Working with a gap, if, if you've noticed what I've tried to capture today in uh, one single talk is, you know, being in a white cube space, being in a, you know, an intervention somewhere in the middle of the mountains, given a commission, having a solo in a gallery space. I, I just wanted to capture, you know, different environments. And based on my experience throughout these courses is sketches are always handy. Um, they kind of, like, like an architect, you need a plan uh, to build. And for me, I feel like without initial studies, especially like working with very heavy material or very expensive material, um, it's, it's quite important to consider uh, a bit of study before you go ahead. Uh, a lot of prototypes are done, especially with the copper pieces, because there were places for, you know, error and accidents. Uh, so all of these works were initially done with aluminum, uh, paper, and then uh, when we were, when we successfully managed to create these prototypes with uh, aluminum, then we moved into copper, as you know, copper is a very expensive material to deal with. And uh, can you, can you remind me with the rest of the question of the Swizzies? Yeah, the second part of the question is, do you prefer to play organically with the material without a set intention of the final artwork's ultimate form? Uh, I find it very enjoyable to, to just go organically and play around, um, especially with the sound. So I could have just bought colored sound from China. And I remember um, one of my really good friends, Jumeiri, had a pink, a pink sand room. And I asked him, like, where did you get that? And he was like, I'm going to help you. You can purchase that material. But for me, it's not about just that shelf color that I wanted to kind of capture within the work. So this act of organically trying to find the color, mixing it on my own. Um, so this, yeah, I enjoy it. Um, again, this kind of process led is something that I truly enjoy. With that said, would you uh, maybe show us around your studio, um, a few prototypes or finished work, if I may say? I have a, a bit of this, a bit of that. Um, just gonna plug out my battery. I thought my laptop was gonna run out of. Um, so uh, I will stop sharing the screen so you can get a better view. Yeah. And you can also, for everyone, have it on speaker view so that it's a larger screen. So here I've got like some of the finished pieces that were also exhibited at uh, Laurie Shibibi. I've got these works that were never exhibited. So as you can see here, this is a marble piece um, with a strap and it changes kind of its form. Um, I've got another piece that was also never seen before, not exhibited, which is um, a metal structure with a marble, uh, or organic as well, uh, circular form resting on this uh, metal sheet. Um, 
these horrific questions sent by Christiana de Marque that kept me puzzled for about three months. But there, uh, I wouldn't have been where I am today without these questions. Um, I've got some of my books. Um, what else? Um, another piece of work here. Um, I've got a wheel, but I'm not going to pretend I've been using it. <laughs> no, <laughs> I haven't. I've got uh, these shades of uh, test that I've done initially. So this is like a piece of the resin block that I've tested before um, going with a bigger scale. So answering Susie prototypes and sketches are very important when you're handling heavy material as well. Um, those are all the shades. Those are for all my blues. <laughs> and um, this is another studious, like where I pretend to be a painter sometimes and store my works. Um, again, answering Susie, uh, prototypes are always handy um, before going large scale. And uh, yeah. This Thanks. is uh, my humble studio. <laughs> it's a great space to work in. And th to see the different processes that um, a work goes through from like prototypes to finished works to artworks that haven't been shown and may just also just still stay in your studio and that is completely fine to just to have that around you is just amazing. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, thank you for considering me to be part of the artist talk. And I'm, I'm really happy to see a lot of uh, people I know here today um, and how, you know, this pandemic got us closer than ever. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Um, yeah, so I think we're going to end it here, but we will have uh, a more focused or natural dialogue for those that would like to stay further, but it is officially ended. Um, for questions that weren't answered or additional comments, like this would be the time to interact with me and Sheikha and just let the conversation flow. Um, yeah, I'll just start us off uh, with a question that was sent to me in the beginning. And if anyone else would like to chime in, um, Tima asked, uh, as an educator, what are your thoughts on the current state of our education in general and in the UAE in particular? Uh, is that question related to the pandemic, the current? Um, uh, I'm, I don't have clarification on that, but we could just say in general. Not not the pandemic, just in general. Okay. I mean, oh, that's everything, but just in general, I was curious. Thank what you. <laughs> I can read uh, Christiana's horrific questions uh, in the chat. Uh, Christiana, they are actually the most beautiful questions, uh, but they kept me on my toes. I couldn't sleep. And <laughs> not horrific, horrific, horrific in a good way. Um, going back to Tima. Um, we're, we're very lucky. Um, I remember getting into an art school a decade ago and there was only one university offering uh, uh, fine arts, which was College of Fine Arts, University of Sharjah. However, today uh, we see a, a drastic growth uh, it, from an educational perspective, from an institutional perspective, from entities, governments, supporting uh, young artists, emerging artists, uh, established artists and not only uh, showing them um, in UAE but also giving them the international exposure. Um, I, I've got news to break. I mean, um, I've been I've been working I've been studying at the College of Fine Arts and Design, University of Sharjah. Uh, I graduated with my BFA and came back to teach seven years ago, um, and now I'm in the process of taking another opportunity um, to dive into a different type of growth. Um, okay, and I there's another question from 
Jill. Uh, she says, how do you feel about a viewer who enters your exhibition space not knowing about the source of the work? What if they simply experience the work as beauty or beautiful? Is that okay? In other words, what if the work splits off from its originary impulse? I think we can control that. Um, there's always text that comes along with the work. Um, I remember coming across uh, Jill's work um, at uh, Jamil Art Center in the book archive section. And just to go through the books, I would have just thought that these books were part of their library. But my role as an, you know, as an artist, as a viewer, as a curious human being, my role is to read beyond the works. And uh, I believe, um, I believe in, it's, it's an open-ended space, honestly. So it really depends on the viewer to push that ended space whether to just read it as aesthetical, uh, minimalist uh, work or to read beyond what the works are. And just to go back to um, education and that theme, um, when, when you were talking about um, working through a, a gallery space or an institution or a studio, um, or even within uh, the college the, itself, like how has that uh, changed your education or like the forms of education that you have gained from that? I have been very lucky to be taught by uh, amazing instructors back in the day. And I wish she was here today. Um, some people might re recall his name. Um, Elizabeth Stoney, for example, Colin Rainey. I was really in very good hands and I was always looking up to them. And as a student, um, I felt like they were, you know, even as an artist, uh, an art educator is a person who gets emotionally connected with students, not on a level of, uh, you know, you know more about the works, you know, what's behind the work, the drive force behind the work. And, um, yeah, I feel like um, going back to your question, if you can, uh, uh, re, uh, if you can uh, manage to say the question again, uh, Sarah. Sorry, I got emotionally driven with uh, being an educator and uh, being around students. No worries. Um, no, just the different environments uh, or institutions that you have uh, come across in your practice. I was wondering how that has also um, added to your education because you were talking about you're a co constantly a student um so how how the how have those experiences changed you i wouldn't say changed but i would say allow the works or allow me as an artist to mature yeah and we have a few questions coming in one is from uh, shamar amli uh, she wonders about the relationship between the artist's hand in in the process and production and the relationship with working with artisans and material production from a collaborative perspective. So I would like if you can break the question a little bit down. Um, so one long sentence, but um, uh, the relationship, if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between the artist's hand and product process and production and the relationship with working with Lagging a bit. You're, you're lagging a bit. It's my. Can you hear me now? I will try to look for the question from Shema. My internet connection has been. Yeah. <laughs> so Shema asked, I want. I wonder about the relationship between the artist hand and the process and the production, and the relationship within working with artisans and material production from collaborative perspective. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I always tend to, um, I'm very um, handy within my work and obviously some of the works that requires manufacture process. Um, even that I always tend to be like in industrial areas working along with the, you know, with the labors uh, we don't unfortunately here in the emirates we don't have dedicated places to create it's not like 
uh, I mentioned earlier, like going to Switzerland to create. Um, in, in, in the Emirates, we go to the industrial area to look for materials uh, or to fabricate. So uh, if I get the opportunity to be in the industrial area, learn a new technique of welding, I'd be one of those people who would spend time uh, because I'm very attached to making and I'm very attached to uh, creating my own work. Um, and just out of uh, curiosity, I always tend to want to learn more. Um, when I was there at Kunskizarai um, uh, in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, I felt a little bit detached. So the works were done by fabricators. And uh, for me as an artist, I feel like there's, there's this almost a gap that I, I always want to like grasp into. Um, so going back to Shema's question, the relationship uh, is, is a space in between again. <laughs> So th there's today we see works like these works were welded, um, welded with other fabricators, with other artisans to, to create. Thank you. And um, Harud is asking, um, going back with the topic of education, um, you spoke a little about the relationship between you and your students. Has becoming an educator impacted your practice? And if so, how? Definitely. Again, um, some of the educators here today uh, might relate to what, I want to, what I'm about to say. So uh, it's such a fruitful environment. It's a place like almost a win-win situation. Um, you're constantly inspired by younger minds. Uh, you're constantly put in a space where you have to prepare, you have to, uh, you know, write down proposals, you're expected to read, that, read back proposals uh, from students. Um, they just keep you constantly curious. And we, we, for example, we tackle a specific subject and 10 of them would come with different directions and different approaches that you as an instructor hasn't, you know, haven't thought about it to begin with. So it's, it's always inspiring space. It's, um, they keep you always curious. They keep you eager to learn. And I think also for the students as well, it's definitely a win-win situation and having you as a instructor is, uh, is a great time to have. Um, with, and there's, who has a follow-up to that, um, not, not necessarily with that question, but another question. She says, during the absence of Christiana's horrific questions, um, and there isn't a person pushing and challenging your thought process, how do you push and challenge yourself? So as I mentioned earlier, the, as an artist, it's always important to sit back and reflect on your own practice. So I tend to do this a lot and I also preach to my students to do this a lot. Um, it's important to like sit down and criticize your own work. Um, and I had multiple discussions with Christiana and I remember when I first had uh, I asked Mariah Center that I would like to work with Christiana. Um, she, she welcomed me with two hands and I was in a very vague place myself because I was too kind of, I was very, I was restricting myself to be personally, in, you know, engaging personal uh, approaches within my work. And she managed to bring that out of me through the books I was reading, through the questions she was imposing. And she, she, did it, she did it in a very clever way. So she managed to really pick out lines from the books I was reading that would tackle exactly what I was experiencing and pulled out that from my mouth beautifully. Um, and I just wanted someone, I, I believe Christiana managed to do that successfully. Um, and that's where the role of the curator comes to, a successful curator comes to play is to find that kind of gap between where the artists want to create and under what themes and what uh, concepts and bring the, br almost bridges, bridges that uh, uh, gap. Um, so yeah, 
self-reflection and working with excellent curators is, is definitely an interesting um, direction to push your work further. And, and on that note, there's a question asking, um, what are some thoughts about how your practice might go on following rearranging the riddle? Um, and where do you draw inspiration from now? Sit back and reflect. So um, I don't think I would like to, if you think about the title of the show, it's not arranging the riddle, it's rearranging the riddle. It's like almost trying to rearrange something that is a riddle in itself. So I think I've, I've really experimented with a lot of uh, concepts behind the works, working uh, with text, working with numbers, working. For me, my, the, the show has allowed my practice to shift drastically. And I'm interested in that shift. And I'm not trying, as an artist, I'm not trying to create a signature. And I'm not trying to like, oh, these are the works that I'm doing and I'm just creating repetitions of them. And I feel like uh, allowing yourself to be way much experimental in, uh, you know, being a sponge and observing, uh, you know, observing things around you, books you're reading, trying to, you know, to expand what you're reading is definitely something interesting. Um, so um, I never thought that these two books were ever going to be artworks later on. So they were purely, I was, I was very interested in their titles. I was very interested in the thematics, uh, the themes behind the works. Uh, what Bryony uh, Fair discusses in her work, like, because she almost was pinpointing at minimalist artists saying there isn't empty signifier with, you know, with minimalist work. There's always a loaded, overcharged meaning behind the works, even if they were very minimal in their aesthetics. And that in itself really provoked me as an artist. And I wanted to kind of elaborate uh, on that. And that was just a starting point. So I don't know what kind of other starting points are, are going to be there, whether to reflect or continue reading. And um, there, isn't, uh, there isn't a restriction for a creative soul. So you can be inspired by nothing or everything. Do you think that the charge um, behind minimalist art is uh, narrative, perhaps? They wanted to strip away from narrative. They were really more about the formal qualities in space and the industrial mass produced uh, works. So, but even when saying that, it becomes a narrative in itself. So by taking that approach of, we are rebelling against abstract and impression, uh, impressionist, but that in itself, is that act in itself is a narrative and you know diverting to the mass produced uh, minimal kind of directions and with the idea of narrative there's a question i'm asking um uh, Jill, uh very, she's very interested in the moment when narrative scaffolding fall falls away and we are simply left with the work perhaps if possible beyond the words um i'm not sure if that's a comment or a question uh just a comment <laughs> just a comment great <laughs> um and we're gonna end the session um in a bit but i'd just like to throw the question out there the last one um from rebecca she's asking do you find that concept leads to finding the materials or material leads to finding the concept? Um, I mentioned um, earlier that uh, you would see two directions within my work. So one, you see that the titles of the work, the concepts were there and they kind of dictated the materiality of the works, especially in the very last show I had with Mariah. So uh, they were based on conversations, based on concepts, based on feelings that I wanted to kind of then project them into artworks. Whereas my previous work, I was really curious with the materials. I wanted to create that tension, that stability. So I was making and the concept was forming along the way and the titles were coming along the way. So there isn't uh, like, there isn't this is right or this is right. I think it, it's really based on your experimentation or the concepts driving these experimentations. Yeah, definitely. Um, and if anyone would like to uh, unmute and comment or question, now is the time. 
um, to have a conversation. Um, I can just start, just, I think we're going to do like five, seven minutes since it's a bit over time, but uh, just to get the conversation going, when I first went to the exhibition and got to see it, I was really attracted to the color blocks and their names. And uh, I know we had a conversation about this uh, previously, but I really liked the way that you approached these color. Oh no, my internet connection. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Now? now I can hear you. I'm so sorry. My internet connection all day has been like up and down. So <laughs> I'm really sorry for that. I don't know where I got cut off. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say that I really like the approach that you took with the idea of environment of a color. Um, so if you could just talk a little bit about that and if anyone wants to jump in, um, and if not, then I think we're just gonna end it there with color. Um, they're, they're kind of, um, sarcastic in a way, um, you know, when, when you think about like color labels, one of them, I remember before falling into the blue shades, um, there was like exotic peach. And they're quite, quite absurd and funny. And what is exotic peach? Um, and those labels, like as soon as you look at the color, you no longer look at the color. You start thinking of that exotic peach in a way. Um, and that transformation of a thought from a color to almost a tangible object uh, is what led these works. Is when reading like a blueprint, you think of you look at the color blueprint and it is the shade of the papers that comes in a blueprint uh, shades. So uh, transforming them into physical uh, colors, they are actually casted colors. So I bought these market shelf colors and casted them in blocks. Uh, you can see some of the blocks here, casted them in like rectangular blocks to transform them into that uh, physicality. Um, hi, Sheikh. I just want to say I'm a big fan of your work. Um, I also went with Sarah actually to see your work and it was so mesmerizing. Um, my question right now is like, I love how you kind of talk about your process and how it's this exhaustive, um, you know, like you exhaust the materials until like you find this uh, sense of this Discovery, the sense of discovery, the way you like are very like touchy, tangible person from childhood. Um, how did that come about? And just a follow up after that is that: Do you find yourself doing like little, um, you know, routines before you get into thinking about an idea or a concept for an art piece? And if you do, then can you please share that as well? All right. Um, I think um, talking about like being curious and very handy and touchy and all of that. Uh, during my BFA time, towards the uh, my senior year, I started working with uh, circuit boards that are found in computers, and that in itself is like a process of discovery. Because I remember buying all these uh, obsolete computers and opening them up because I wanted to pull out these circuit boards. Um, that act in itself was almost like opening up a Kinder surprise because I was very specific about pulling out circuit boards that had specific colors. And, you know, I would just like hope it would be red and they usually come in green in circuit boards. I think that, uh, you know, slowly started to become almost, this is where I started to find myself more curious uh, in materiality and touching and feeling holding things by hand. I think working a lot with sculpture medium itself already puts you in that mindset. Um, working with clay, uh, I've worked with clay a lot. Uh, you have to accept uh, what comes when you kind of sign up working with clay. So it's a very experimental process. You work with, uh, you spend uh, weeks on molding and shaping and pressing in molds and then putting it in a kiln and you should expect and accept 
what would come out of that cone, whether the sides shrink or whether you open it up and it's half broken or exploded. And I feel like that experimentation had allowed me to always be hands-on and, um, yeah, I think um, answering your question and following uh, following up the second question was, um, I'm losing chain of thought. So if you would remind me with the second question. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you for answering the first question. Uh, just like um, in before you, you know, start the, I guess, ideation process and like coming up with your next art piece, are there like, I guess, um, a routine that you follow or are there little like exercises that you do to just kind of get either your hands or your mind thinking about something you want to, you know, put out there? Um, I, I've been, ever since I came back from, uh, London, I've been uh, very fortunate to be represented by a gallery. And being represented by a gallery already puts dates and times and expectations in working with institutions such as ADMAP, Art Abu Dhabi, Mariah already like puts you in that mindset. So there are always deadlines and dates that you have to catch up with. Um, looking for an environment is, as you can see, I no longer have a majlis or a dining room. I've turned it into both studio spaces and um, being around students all the time keeps me in that uh, mindset. So I don't, there isn't a time for a creative energy. So as I mentioned earlier, there, nothing can inspire you or everything around you can inspire you. I've been, I've been around students, colleagues, peers. My colleagues are artists as well. Uh, you know, my colleagues are photographers, printmakers, painters, art historians. So you're always in that kind of, uh, an inspirational environment that keeps you going. For sure. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much. And I think with that, um, it ends our session for today. But I just wanted to say um, a special thank you to Sheikha. I think uh, kn knowing a little bit about your work beforehand and uh, learning uh, from you constantly is just uh, is a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. It's an absolute pleasure uh, for me uh, to be invited to this artist talk. And honestly, it makes me so happy to see the screen with so much uh, familiar names and faces. Um, again, it's funny how this pandemic got us closer than ever. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, a weird situation, but just trying to connect. I really applaud you, Sarah, for doing this initiative and uh, you're, the one, uh, you're the one to thank to honestly bring, you know, 50, 60 people in one room in one space uh, to discuss uh, and keep us, uh, you know, just, you know, with, by, by inviting me, you already put me in my desk and, you know, collect my material. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, Sarah's keeping me on my toes already. And I started to, that act in itself, is sitting down and compiling images and thinking about, you know, chronological order in itself as a reflective moment on your own practice. So, you know, being able to speak about your work in front of, you know, your friends, colleagues, peers, anonymous people that you don't even know is, is a very healthy uh, practice in itself. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for this initiative. And uh, I'll be looking forward for uh, after eight talks. Inshallah. <laughs> thank you so much everyone for coming out here today with your time. I'm probably breaking up again. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm so sorry for the internet. <laughs> it's bound to happen. It's all right. Okay, <laughs> thank you everyone for your time. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> Bye.